Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Ulster Beekeepers uh, Winter Webinars. Uh, this is our third webinar, and uh, which will be delivered by Professor Jane Stout. We are going to give a few minutes just to allow uh, the participants to, to come in. So if you will bear with me, um, and uh, we'll certainly uh, give you an advertisement here to look at, which is from our generous sponsors, which is Donegal Bees. Now, so we're up to about 180 participants so far. We're just going to let it uh, take a minute or two just to allow this to fill up. I hope the weather is all good with you and that your bees are all in good order for this time of the year. Well, we're having a very good audience this evening. We've just reached 200. It'll maybe just take another minute or so and we'll see how, how it goes. I think uh, uh, we've got little greetings here from Connor Gleason in Tipperary. He says that it's raining very heavy, heavily with them. So uh, I think, unfortunately, we're about to get very uh, heavy rain later on this evening in Northern Ireland. So anyway, I think we're up to... Um, more volume. 213 participants. Uh, if I could just say to Joe, um, I've just had one query from Susie just to say is that the possibly see if we can increase the volume possibly if that is if that is possible. I suspect that's on her computer, John. There's, there's right. um, let me just see. I'll just check and see if there's anything I can do. Let me send audio settings. Do you want to do a testing one, two, three and see how that works, yeah, John? Testing one, two, three. Oh, I've got another person here come through from Andy saying that the volume was fine. And David Morgan saying that the uh, volume was okay at his end. Right, okay. Uh, well, I think we should make a start. Well, I'd just say welcome, uh, everybody, um, to the Ulster Beekeepers Association Winter Webinars. This is our third um, uh, winter webinar, uh, which is uh, the series is coming in place of the fact that we're not able to have a conference this year due to COVID, but I'm very hopeful that we could possibly return to normal maybe next year in 2022. You say this evening's webinar is being given by Professor Jane Stout from Trinity College Dublin. The lecture is sponsored by Donegal Bees, and as you can say, you can see there's an advert here for them. And we'll be paying, playing a short video at the end of the talk. If I can just quickly say that our next webinar will be on February the 3rd, which will be on Queen Management Essentials. And this will be given by Professor Juliana Rangel, who is from Texas A&M University. Uh, uh, she lectured with us a few years ago and she's very generously decided that she's going to give a lecture to us next week. Anyway, if I could come back to this evening, as I say, our speaker is Professor Jane Stout, who is Professor of Botany in Trinity College, Dublin. And she's an internationally renowned expert on pollinator and pollination ecology and a prominent voice for biodiversity and its value. Her research seeks to understand how land management practices, including agriculture and urbanization, affect ecological processes and the benefits of nature for humans. Uh, she leads a large team of researchers on the plant-animal interactions research group in botany in the School of Natural Sciences in Trinity. She is the co-founder and the chair of the board of the Irish Forum of, on Natural Capital and co-founder and Deputy Chair of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, which can be found at www.pollinators.ie. This is a group of which we hope in the Ulster Beekeepers to, to be doing a lot of work with in the forthcoming years. Anyway, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jane.
That's great. Thank you very much, John. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Thank you for the invitation to, to come and speak to you. Um, seems like a, a, a million years since we were in Antrim for the, the beekeepers meeting last spring um, and uh, with everything that's happened. It's, it's lovely to be back. So thank you very much for inviting me. So this evening, uh, I'm going to talk about landscaping bees. Um, and really just thinking about uh, what kind of resources bees need from a landscape. Um, and I'm also going to give a little uh, taster of some of the research projects that, that my group are currently working on to, to assess uh, how bees use landscapes in Ireland. So I thought I'd better start off with a definition. It's always good to start a lecture with a definition. What do we mean by landscape? Um, well, landscape has been defined as a heterogeneous area composed of a cluster of interacting ecosystems. Uh, so what that means is just, the, you know, if we look at the landscape in this picture, we've got lots of different patches of habitat or types of ecosystems that are all interacting with each other. We've got the crops, we've got the hedges, the riparian areas, the woodland ecosystem, and, and all of these ecosystems um, make up the landscape, the ec ecological landscape. And our bees experience this landscape in, in different ways, depending on what kinds of habitats and ecosystems are there, uh, the pattern those habitats and ecosystems make up, uh, and the scale at which the bees experience the landscape. And this, the way that they experience the landscape can depend on their flight distances. So for example, if this is our, our little patch of landscape, if we've got a solitary bee that might only forage within uh, maybe a couple of hundred meters of their nest, if their nest is on the edge of this little patch of woodland in this farmland, then the landscape that they experience within 200 meters of their nest only encompasses the patch of woodland, a couple of different fields, a couple of different crop types and some hedges. If you've got another species, perhaps maybe its foraging range is a bit bigger and it nests in the same place on the edge of this little patch of woodland. When it forages, if, if it goes up to 500 meters, it experiences a greater diversity of habitat in their landscape. So we've got different types of uh, fields, different kinds of crops. We've got more woody patches, there's houses, there's gardens, there's road verges. And so the experience of the landscape varies because these bees forage a bit further. When we think about our social bees, our honeybees, our bumblebees, um, they can forage several kilometres. So here we've got the same, if you can see in the, in the middle of the screen there, if your eyesight's very good, they've still got that same little um, black dot showing um, a, a, a hive or a colony on the edge of that little patch of forage. But if, if forest, but if the bees can forage up to, to five kilometres, then their landscape encompasses a huge diversity of habitats right into these uplands. Um, in the west of the image here, there's riparian habitats, there's um, urban areas, much, much more, more dense urban areas. So when we talk about landscape from the bees' perspective, it does depend on which species of bee we're thinking about. And remember in Ireland, we've 99 different species of bee, 22 of them are the social bees, including the honeybee, and we've got 77 solitary bee species. And they all have different scales or different um, foraging range, flight distances, so different scales at which they interact with the landscape. So what do bees need from their landscape? Well, I think, you know, the first thing we think about when we think about what bees need is that they need flowers. They need floral resources for nutrition. So both solitary and social bees depend on floral resource resources to, to, to power their life cycle. Um, so nectar is mostly made up of sugars and this provides energy for activities, for flying, for mating, etc. And then, of course, bees also collect pollen, and pollen contains proteins, amino acids, lipids, other good stuff that's good for the development uh, and growth of bees. And so this is the primary food for, for bee larvae. And different plant species provide different amounts and qualities of nectar and pollen. They provide them at different times of the year. Different bee species have different nutritional uh, requirements and preferences and so a diversity of flowering species is required in the landscape and I'm sure as, as beekeepers you're very well aware that different plant species vary in the quantity and quality of nectar and pollen that they produce. So in terms of pollen, pollen's up to, to a third protein 
Um, but pollen from different species contains varying proportions of essential amino acids. So he, here's some, just some pie charts from a, a, um, a student of mine who looked at different species and actually quantified the amino acid content of the pollen. And you can see in the colored wedge of the pie there, we've got different essential amino acids and then the rest, the, the gray part of the pie is the non-essential amino acids. So we can just see, just looking at these four really common species, Vicia, um, Bramble, um, uh, Epilobium and, and, and Foxglove, we see just in these four common species um, differences in the relative proportions of the different amino acids in the pollen. Um, and the same goes for nectar. So nectar um, is, is basically a sugar solution, contains the monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, um, and the disaccharide sucrose. Um, and the percentage of sugar in nectar can range hugely from, from being very uh, weak. Uh, it, it's sort of five, less than 5% less than sugar, all the way up to about 80% sugar in any any anything over 75% sugar becomes a bit too, a bit too dense, a bit too thick. Um, and again, it, it varies according to plant species. Um, and so this uh, graph here just shows uh, nectar uh, secretion rates. So we can see that different plant species not only have different uh, amounts of sugar in their nectar, but they secrete that sugar at different rates. Um, and in, they have varying proportions as well of the um, different uh, sugar the different the constitute sugars um, and also they produce different total amounts. So we get variation between plant species in both the quantity and the quality of the nectar and pollen that they produce. And also nectar and pollen can contain other trace compounds and some of these can be toxic and there's actually a surprising number of plants that have been found to contain this so-called toxic nectar and it's just some examples of some some well-known ones uh, on the screen here so we've got tobacco plants containing uh, nicotine coffee plants and, and citrus plants contain caffeine nicotine and caffeine are both um, alkaloids um, Prunus um, almonds contain uh, amygdalin, which is a, a cyanogenic glycoside, uh, and then rhododendron ponticum, which is the invasive rhododendron species that we have here in Ireland, contains uh, a grayanotoxin, which is a, a, a diterpene. Um, and why plants would ladle uh, their, their nectar full of toxins when their nectar is there to, to reward their pollinators is a good question. And there's lots of hypotheses that have been suggested for why you, you, you get this toxic nectar um, in various plant species. And, and, you know, there's been various suggestions, including maybe deterring non-pollinating non herbivores. Um, maybe this, the, the toxins have some sort of antimicrobial function. Um, they might have an addictive effect on pollinators, keeps them coming back, makes them more efficient. Or, they, or these toxins might simply be in nectar just as a consequence of the fact that they're in the other plant tissues. And so they're also then produced in, in the nectar. Um, the effects of these toxins on bees have been studied uh, mostly in terms of honeybees um, and studies have found that bees can actually prefer flowers that, that contain things like alkaloids at low concentrations, but they tend to reject them when the concentrations get higher. So, for example, um, lab trials with honeybees um, being fed caffeine in, in a sugar solution, we found at low concentration caffeine in the sugar solution could actually help the bees to remember a learned floral scent. But because caffeine is very bitter, if it occurs at a, at a higher concentration, it actually repels the bees. Um, so this is actually a pretty neat system because it, the, the natural concentration that you get in the wild, um, it has a pharmacological effect on the memory of the foragers, but it's not enough to poison them and it's not enough to repel them. So the plant is actually lacing its nectar with um, caffeine at just the right concentration um, to, to, to enhance the bees' memories, but not to turn them off and this could help pollination. Our own studies, uh, we've, we've done some work with rhododendron ponticum and uh, the grayanotoxins and looked at the effect of grayanotoxins in nectar on different bee species, so on honeybees, on a, a solitary species of mining bee and on a species of bumblebee. And what we found actually was that the effects of the toxin were very different in the different bee species. So the grayanotoxins had a very uh, rapid lethal effect on honeybees. Uh, they didn't have a lethal effect on the solitary bees, but the solitary bees certainly changed their behaviour. So we, we, we um, determined they were 
showing symptoms of malaise, which basically meant they weren't very well. And if they were in the wild, they probably wouldn't survive, but it didn't kill them outright. Uh, whereas the honeybee, the bumblebees, sorry, could eat granotoxin for weeks and weeks and be absolutely fine. So the, the, these toxins, these secondary plant compounds that appear in nectar and pollen have differential effects on different pollinator groups. Um, but obviously bees need more than just flowers in their landscapes. Um, it's not just all about floral resources. And I think we do get very hung up on floral resources when we think about what, what bees need from a landscape and very often our conservation measures for, for, for um, uh, trying to promote bees in the landscape involve uh, floral resources. But bees need more than just flowers. So this is a figure from a recent study that uh, invested the other resources, investigated, sorry, the other resources that bees need. Um, and a good proportion of bees rely on non-floral resources. So this figure shows that actually 32% of bee species worldwide use non-floral resources. So they use them as a, as a nutrient source, so to supplement floral nutrient um, sources. They use them for nesting material or they use them to protect their nests or themselves. And what this figure also shows is that these two, there's two of the biggest families of bees, the apidae and the megachylidae. So the apidae contains obviously the honeybees and the bumblebees, but also things like carpenter bees and orchid bees. And the megachylidae uh, contain the, the leaf cutting bees, mason bees, resin bees. Uh, and a lot of these uh, bees in these two families need non-floral resources for, for nest building, for defense, protection and for health. So for example, resin uh, is known to improve, improve the health um, and resistance to, to pests and diseases in stingless bees and also in the honeybee, Apis mellifera. Uh, and this picture on the right hand side here is of a resin bee, which is a, a megachylid. Um, and what these bees do is they collect resin and they mix it with um, small stones in order to construct their nests. And so a lot of solitary bees actually use non-floral resources in their nesting. Um, so solitary bees in, in both of these big families, in both the apidae and the megachylidae, they use resin, they use leaf pieces, they use leaf hair secretions and other materials in constructing uh, or protecting the brood cells of their nest. So particularly within the, the orchid bees um, and the oil collecting bees, uh, and of course the leaf cutter bees. And what we've got here in the photograph um, are leaf cutter bees that are using leaf pieces. So they cut leaf pieces, they, they fly back to the nest carrying them in their legs and they use these to, to block up the entrance of, of their nests. And so you very often see them uh, in, in, if you have a bee hotel in your garden, you can see some of these, um, these bee hotels have uh, the, the entrances um, to, to the tubes blocked up with leaves. And actually, you can see on this picture, you, some of these entrances to the tubes are blocked up with leaves, some are blocked up with mud, you can see different colours. And what this just shows is this diversity of materials that are used by different species and by different individuals within the same species. So they use mud and soil, and, and some species apparently even use faeces to, to uh, input in their nest construction. So bees need more than just flowers, they need these other uh, resources. And of course, as well as needing nesting materials, they need the nesting sites as well. And most solitary bees worldwide nest in the ground. So either in amongst the vegetation. So in the top left hand picture here, we've got these little mounds of soil and these little holes um, in, in the, uh, basically a grassy lawn. Um, and these are made by mining bees, Andrina mining bees. And in the top right, we've got here bees nesting in, in a bare earth bank. These are actually ivy bees. Um, and what these solitary bees do is they dig down into the soil uh, and then create a little network of tunnels um, that lead to their brood chambers. Um, and although most solitary bees uh, tend to prefer to make their nests alone, you get aggregations. So some, some species are more sociable and they build their nests in groups or aggregations. So like these, these um, ivy bees in the top right hand picture, you can sometimes get really dense aggregations with lots and lots of individuals nesting together. So most solitary bees nest in the ground, but some do nest in cavities. Um, so naturally these cavities could be holes in twigs or, or holes in walls, but obviously these cavity nesting bees are also the ones that would nest in bee hotels. Um, and the pictures that I've put at the bottom here are two species of mason bee, 
that we have here in Ireland. So on the, the, the bottom left in the middle picture um, is the red mason bee, and this is the one that usually nests in holes in masonry or in our bee hotels and the bee boxes. Um, and then on the bottom right hand corner there, we've got this beautiful gold fringed mason bee. Uh, and this is a coastal dwelling bee. It only lives on sand dunes uh, and it only makes its nest in the empty shell of a snail. So in terms of what this species of bee needs from the landscape, it's very different to what our ivy bees or our mining bees or, or the red mason bees need. So in terms of what, um, what bees need from a landscape in terms of nesting sites, that can also vary along with needing different best nesting materials. Um, and you probably will know most bumblebees tend to nest underground. And I've just got a very short little uh, video clip in here. This is a bumblebee nest that I spotted um, just a hole in the ground uh, in a flower bed, actually in, in the Botanic Gardens in Cambridge, so nowhere particularly special. Um, but most bumblebees nest in the ground um, or at the surface of the ground. Often bumblebees will nest in old rodent burrows or, or under hedgerows in tusky grass or, or quite often in gardens you find them under patios or under garden sheds etc. So we, bees, different bees of different species need a variety of nesting sites as well. Um, and this diagram is just from the same paper that I mentioned earlier about this, these non-floral resources that bees need, and I think it sums it up quite nicely. So in a landscape, bees need the flowers, obviously, for nectar and, and pollen, but also they need non-flower food resources. Um, and a recent study has shown that actually intake of fungi, so mushroom mycelium, can support honeybees' immune systems by uh, inhibiting pathogens, uh, which that was a new one to me, that, that, that was fascinating. Um, and it's, it's long been known that, that um, honeybees and other bees will collect honeydew uh, and uh, other insect related secretions. Um, and also, you know, they may collect nectar from non floral nectaries as well. So these are nectaries on plants that aren't associated with flowers. But then of course, bees also use um, non-floral resources um, for nesting materials, as, we, as we've just discussed, in terms of leaves and resins um, and that kind of thing. So what affects the availability of all of these resources in the landscape? So these floral and these non-floral resources, these, these nesting resources. Well, if we think about what the bees need, so they need flowers, they need nest substrates, they need nesting resources, they need, we've mentioned this, but often they need specific places to mate uh, or to overwinter, um, and they need um, appropriate climatic or, or microclimatic conditions. And the availability of these resources is affected at a local scale, at a site level, by uh, the vegetation that's growing there, whether it's um, natural vegetation or crop or an invasive species, um, it varies according to whether there's pest or, or weed control, um, if there's, there's crop management um, going on or the size of the patch of habitat or the field, uh, whether there are any managed bees there present, et cetera, et cetera. But also the availability of these resources is affected by what's going on in the surrounding landscape. Um, so when we talk about what Bees, how bees are influenced by landscape, as I said earlier, it depends on the scale at which they perceive the landscape, but it also depends on what's going on in that landscape. So how many different types of habitat there are. So, you know, is it natural habitat, agricultural, urban? Um, what, are the, what are the different um, land uses in that landscape? And also the spatial arrangement and distribution of the different patches of habitat in the landscape. So whether they're all clumped together, whether there's, there's um, um, different shapes and sizes um, of different habitat patches. And so we can quantify and describe landscapes in terms of these two metrics, in terms of the composition, so the number of different types of habitats, as well as the shape and size of patches. And so I've just got a couple of little uh, maps here, which just show in, in sort of one kilometer uh, landscape, um, uh, what do we call them, landscape chunks, um, in one, one kilometer uh, landscape um, areas, we can have different compositions. So the landscape on the left here is composed almost entirely of um, it, uh, improved 
grassland for, for pastures and the landscape on the right has more diversity in terms of habitat composition so there's more rough grassland there's more woodland there's more um, other habitat uh, types and land uses so we can describe the, the, the composition of the landscape in terms of the proportion or the area of those different types of habitat. And we can also describe the landscape in terms of how that habitat is arranged. So in terms of the configuration of the habitat. So on the, on the, the bottom left diagram there, we can see that most of the patches in the landscape, they're mostly fields, they're kind of very regular in terms of their shape and their size. Whereas in the, the bottom right hand corner, we can see this landscape that's, that's much more irregular in terms of patch shape and size. And so studies very often look at these two metrics of composition and configuration of the landscape to try and understand how this affects the availability of the resources that bees and, and, and other organisms require and to try and understand how they, they will respond to changes in the landscape. Um, and we know that semi-natural remnants are really important, um, particularly in agricultural landscapes. Um, and it's because these semi-natural remnants tend to provide this, the, the suite of resources that bees need. So for example, studies in Canada have shown that um, when there's more uncultivated land in the landscape, you tend to get more bees visiting your crop. So in this case, it was an oilseed rape crop. And you can see this little graph here uh, on the x-axis across the bottom is the amount of uncultivated landscape. And on the y-axis up the side is the number of bees. And you can see as you get more uncultivated landscape, um, uncultivated land in the landscape, uh, you tend to see more bees visiting the, the crop flowers. Um, similarly, a study in France showed that you get an increase in bee abundance uh, with proximity to forage edge. And so in this case, we've got distance from the forage edge across the bottom of the graph and abundance up the side. And we can see as you get closer to the forest edge, then you get an increase in abundance uh, of bees. So it's important that these semi-natural habitats, um, so things like heathlands, unimproved grasslands, woodlands, wetlands, bogs, all these kind of things occur within a, an agricultural landscape mosaic. Um, and so, to investigate how these semi-natural remnants in the landscape affect pollinators here in Ireland, I've had quite a few students working on this. So Sarah Mullen um, was, did the first piece of work. She was a former PhD student. She surveyed pollinators in semi-natural grassland sites in the Midlands, in, in Roscommon and Offaly. Um, and then another PhD student, Florence Heck, uh, characterised the surrounding landscape. So the, the dot in the middle here is where the pollinators were sampled and, and then the landscape was characterised according to composition and configuration. And what we found was when there's uh, more natural, semi-natural grassland in the landscape, you get more bees and you get more hoverflies. And similarly, when we look at the configuration of the landscape, what we found was that when you've got more irregular shapes and bigger patches in the landscape, then you get more butterflies and more hoverflies. So we know that semi-natural landscapes like these semi-natural, sorry, semi-natural habitats like these semi-natural grasslands are, are important in the landscape for providing resources uh, for, for bees and other pollinators. And we know that um, semi-natural land is, is under pressure. So this is, I, I love this map, this shows um, the percentage grassland area in different uh, countries across Europe. And you can see that Ireland's really quite unusual in that we're very, very dominated um, by grassland. And this is mostly agricultural grassland, um, mostly uh, pastures for, for, for livestock grazing and it's extensive livestock grazing. And in a, a recent survey across farms of different intensities in, in Ireland, we found that between 6 and 41% of farmland area um, was, was semi-natural habitat, could be classified as semi-natural habitat. So these semi-natural habitats would be things like hedgerows and tree lines, um, which are, are, are to some extent protected under agricultural policy, and other semi-natural habitats like um, heathlands, peatlands and woodlands, which, which uh, um, are often not protected um, under payment schemes. And because these, these semi-natural habitats are often not protected by policy or by payments, they become eroded from the farm landscape. So in, in the intensive farms that we surveyed, um, they, they're mostly gone. So we found, you know, a very small percentage of, of the farmed area was actually semi-natural habitat. 
And, and in most of these, then these uh, livestock grasslands, these improved grasslands, really what we're seeing is a single species sword. So we've got the, the lolium perenne, it's not much good for bees, it's, it's not producing uh, uh, many resources. Um, there's an increasing tendency to include clover uh, for, for nitrogen fixation. If, if clover's there and if it's allowed to flower, then, then that can provide some uh, resources for bees. And, and things like, you know, the old fashioned floristically rich hay meadows are becoming much, much rarer. So in these landscapes, these linear features, so here we can see uh, a lovely stone wall covered in vegetation um, and hedgerows and patches of, of um, trees. These, these semi-natural remnants um, are really important because they're containing the resources that bees need for, for nesting, for foraging and for overwintering. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we, we map and we retain and incentivize farmers to maintain these semi-natural uh, features or these habitat features in the landscape. So I'm just going to talk uh, about a few projects that we're working on at the moment where we're trying to do just that. Um, so this is project Farm Ecos, which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, uh, working with several partners. You can see their logos in the top right there, and also the names of all the, the students and the researchers that have been working on this project. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at two quite different catchments, one up in Sligo, one down uh, in Wexford in the Blackstairs. Um, quite different environmental conditions and what we did in each catchment was to map out the, the landscapes, um, so to look at all the, the different land uses in these catchments, um, and then we did detailed um, surveying on 15 farms in each catchment to sample insects and flowers to try and determine how pollinators respond to both the floral abundance on the farm and the various habitat features like hedgerows, um, ditches, banks, stone walls, um, to try and understand this relationship between the bees and the resources that are being provided on the farms. And uh, quite unsurprisingly, really, uh, our preliminary analysis is suggesting that different species respond in different ways and at different scales, uh, for all those reasons that I mentioned earlier. But it's really good to, to, to have the, the evidence base to try and tease this apart and say, okay, how are different species responding? Which species are responding to, to, to which types of habitats and which kinds of floral resources? So that's something that's, that's still in progress is, is that, that unpicking of, of the detail. Um, in another project, this is a project called Farm Zero C, which is an SFI funded project where we're working with um, UCD and Chagask and, and um, uh, um, companies like uh, Carberry and Devonish. What we've done here is we've mapped out the, the map on, on this uh, slide shows um, an intensive dairy farm in West Cork. So you can see all those big green patches are the intensively managed um, improved grasslands. And when we mapped this entire farm, what we found that there was about 7% natural habitat along the edges of the fields, the laneways, um, in, in the little patches of woodlands and wetland. Not a huge area, but this is where the resources are for, for bees, for other pollinators, and for a lot of other wildlife. And actually what we did on this project was to say, okay, how can we actually increase the amount of natural habitat and, and how much effort does it take? And actually, the, the, the quality of the, the natural habitat and the amount of natural habitat can be improved with, with surprisingly little effort. So things like reducing mowing on non-cropped areas and, and not using herbicides on non-cropped areas. So not draining small wet corners of fields uh, and allowing wetlands to develop, cutting hedgerows less severely on three-year rotations and protecting hedgerows from grazing and that kind of thing. And these actions that can then benefit pollinators by providing resources don't just help the pollinators, they also then are beneficial for other wildlife. So that's something we're continuing to work with the, the commercial and, and the intensive dairy farmers to try and uh, improve. Um, I'm sure John mentioned at the beginning the, the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Uh, we, we developed guidelines for farmland a couple of years ago um, from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and the, these guidelines basically were recommending to farmers to, to maintain the flowering hedgerows and allow wildflowers around the farm um, in order to provide uh, floral resources for, for bees and other pollinators, but also to provide nesting places to reduce the use of artificial fertilizers and to reduce the use of pesticides. And all of these things improve resource availability for bees and other pollinators on farmland. 
And subsequently, we, we developed this, this project called Protecting Farm and Pollinators, which is uh, run by the National Biodiversity Data Centre. It's funded by um, European, European Innovation Partnership uh, funding. Um, and this project is working with farmers in Kildare, with, with 40 farmers across Kildare, and, and scoring each of those farms based on criteria to do with the number of flowering hedgerows, pollinator friendly trees, looking at pesticide inputs, flowering margins and flowering fields, and getting a score for the farm on how pollinator friendly it is, and then working with farmers to both try and improve their score, um, and to make sure that, that you know we've got the evidence right, that the scores actually reflect the resources and diversity of pollinators that are found on farms. And so this is what Serla talked about um, at the, um, uh, the, the conference uh, last spring. Uh, she talked about this project. So we, we, it, it's a project whereby um, we're actually refining these scores and refining the the process as we understand more about the the, the resources on the farms um, and then uh, I think finally for, for farming projects this is um, uh, uh, the Poshby project which is a, a European um, one of these massive um, uh, multi-partner projects uh, which we're involved in and also the Federation of Irish Beekeepers are involved in and what we've done uh, as part of this project is to survey 128 sites across the whole of Europe and see the dots on the maps where those those sites fell to quantify stresses to bees across landscapes and we used standard sites that occurred in all countries so that was apple orchards and, and all seed rape fields um, and in 2019, we installed sentinel hives of honeybees, colonies of bumblebees and solitary bee hotels at all of these 128 sites. Uh, we then surveyed the, uh, the resources available to our pollinators. Uh, we looked at the surrounding landscape. We looked at the pollen and nectar that was being brought back to the nests. Uh, and we looked at the bees themselves, all to look at the nutrition of the bees, disease prevalence and pesticide residues across landscape types across Europe. So a huge, huge field um, uh, based project. And now what we're doing is we are um, characterizing the landscapes that each of these fields were in. So we have 128 field sites, 128 landscapes. Um, we've got all these sets of pollinator data and we're trying to determine relationships between landscapes and exposure to these pressures on bee health. And again, preliminary analysis suggests that different pollinator groups, again, are responding differently and that there are differences um, between countries. But again, that's work in progress. Um, so it's, it, just to finish off by saying that we, we're not just working on farmland. Um, obviously, urban areas do provide resources for bees as well. Um, so urban parks. Uh, a lot of urban parks are converting areas to, to wildflowers. Um, the, so the, the top left photo here is Cabantilly Park in, in South County, Dublin. It has some beautiful, extensive wildflower areas. Um, and they're also encouraging reduced pesticide use um, uh, to, to encourage wildflowers as well. Uh, the top right hand picture there, this is from earlier um, I was going to say earlier this year, no, uh, spring last year um, when, when Trinity was, was and the rest of the country was deep in lockdown, um, I managed to sneak into campus one day and we have these lovely wildflower areas that were, were absolutely stunning. Um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm and interest in developing wildflower areas, not just in, in uh, rural locations, but in very, very urban locations like Trinity College campus as well. And lots of people are providing resources as well in their gardens. Um, and things like herb beds obviously are great because they can provide uh, floral resources all year round. Um, and gardens are great as well, as I said before, for providing uh, nesting sites and nesting materials as well. So in terms of urban understanding these urban uh, relationships with landscape, I have a PhD student, Kian, uh, who's been surveying wildflowers and, oh, sorry, all flowers and, and insects across Dublin and the surrounding area. So this map here shows, we've got Dublin down here in the, um, uh, the, the 
right hand side of the map, I should say yeast should know. My mum's a geography teacher, she'd kill me for calling it the right hand side of the map. The east side of the map is Dublin, southeast, uh, and then um, all of these little circles rep represent landscapes that he's sampled, um, and in each of those landscapes he's characterised all the different land uses, so this is one of the urban sites which has a, a high proportion of, of um, uh, impermeable surface, so, so basically built up areas, roads, buildings, etc. And in all of these landscapes, he sampled uh, the, the insects uh, and the flowers, um, and he's, he's um, measured the, 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 their abundance and diversity. And what he's done then is he can then predict up to a, to a bigger landscape scale areas that are rich in resources. And, and sorry, this is so tiny. Um, this, this map is, is that same area around Dublin. Dublin's down in the southeast of the map. And what, what Kean's done here is produce this map um, based on habitat types and based on the, the diversity of flowers you get in the different habitat types. If, you, if you've got good eyesight, you might see a big red blob on the northwest side of, of Dublin city there. That's, that's the Phoenix Park. Uh, and what we can do there is we can we can see um, where there are good flora resources and also what, what, what he's found is that um, on a finer scale, um, things like hedgerows really punch above their weight in rural areas uh, and really deliver lots of resources, uh, floral resources, and really important for providing floral resources at a landscape scale. So um, I, will, I will stop there, I promise I wouldn't talk too long. Uh, so my conclusions is that lots of different resources are needed from landscapes. We tend to focus on floral resources, but we, we mustn't forget that bees need other things as well. Um, and we need to understand what resources different species need um, how these resources are provided by the landscape if we're going to implement effective conservation measures. Um, and we need to manage our landscapes to provide these resources. And, and it's, not, it's not all about flowers. There's, a, there's obviously flowers are very important, but it's not just about providing wildflowers. And I think my last conclusion is that this research requires an awful lot of data, people and, and funding. So I just want to, to finish by acknowledging um, the, the projects that we're currently involved in, the, the funding agencies that are, that are funding our research, but it, most importantly, uh, this team of lovely people in the middle who, who comprise my current research group, who are the ones who are actually out there collecting and, and analyzing the data so that we can make the best informed conservation decisions. And I haven't talked a lot about the pollinator plan this evening, um, but on the right hand side there, I have put the link there, John mentioned earlier, for the All Island Pollinator Plan and the guidelines that go with it is www.pollinators.ie. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to take some questions in a moment. Let's see. Well, Jane, thank you very, very much indeed for that. That was excellent. And I think it really brings uh, to us just how important uh, different landscapes are to the population of pollinators that are there. And I think that very last uh, slide where you showed the, um, the map of Dublin and the areas really showing it the, that the, the biodiverse areas were in the very thin sort of hedgerow uh, uh, edges and um, it really does tend to bring it back to us that beekeepers tend to view very often the countryside as being a bit of the green desert because there really is very very little forage for bees in the middle of fields. Uh, anyway ladies and gentlemen I think that was an excellent lecture. Um, now uh, we are going to have a question and answer session just after we show a short video here from our sponsors Donegal Bees. Uh, if you could please uh, put your questions into the Q&A section rather than the chat, if you could please. And uh, I'll be asking uh, Jane really to, to uh, come back and answer the questions after this short video. Hi guys, uh, just like to say a few words on behalf of Donny Galbees. I'd like to thank everybody for their support after winning the Irish Enterprise Award for Handcrafted Beehives. And just to say a few uh, bits on our beeswax. We are producing beeswax here now in Donegal and we can get uh, old comb or old wax picked up from any beekeeper anywhere in the 32 counties. We're also shipping out every day to the 32 counties. 
there is some difficulties now with Brexit on shipping to England at the moment, but we are focused on getting everything we can out to Irish beekeepers. If you want to avail of our exchange rate on beeswax, just call the office and we can get it picked up for you and get fresh comb out here, fresh wax out here. Thank you. Right, and again, Sri, thank you to Thomas um, at Donegal Bees for uh, that uh, video. I'm very impressed that uh, Thomas has got a machine in now for manufacturing wax foundation. Right, Jane, well, again, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. It was excellent. And if I uh, could really start just with the, the first question here, which is from Mick, he said, or he's asking, is the toxic pollen related? To a certain flower type shape, um, um, uh, you know, in other words, the shape of flowers that would uh, mostly be pollinated by bumblebees. That's a really good question. Um, we and I don't know the answer to it. Is 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 one thing? To, I, I don't think we can generalise that much. So certainly in in rhododendron, we found that bumblebees were more able to cope with the toxins in in rhododendron. But I think in other plant species, it, that that might not always be the case. Um, and across the rhododendron, so we've we've also looked across different species of rhododendron across uh, across its whole range, um, and looked at the pollinators and the amount of toxin. Um, and what we found is that the 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 
the species that are uh, bee or insect pollinated tend to contain the toxins and the species that are bird pollinated tend not to. So there is a relationship between the, the, the pollination agent and, and whether or not these toxins are expressed uh, in rhododendron. I think for, for, for other plant species, we don't know nearly enough about it, but, it, but you know, there's this re these, these relationships between bees and flowers have co-evolved. So it's likely that whoever the legitimate pollinator is of a flower is likely to be able to tolerate its toxins or, or the, the, the um, at least the concentration of those toxins are in, in those flowers. But yeah, no, that's a great question. And that was a really long way of saying, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> what I was thinking of uh, uh, related to that, I mean, indeed, uh, rhododendron is uh, a plant that was brought in from the Far East. So is it possible is that it was being pollinated by different species in the Far East as it can be in Ireland? And therefore, there, there's uh, a problem there for the bees here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's actually, it's really interesting. So the species of rhododendron that's, that's um, invasive in Ireland, Ponticum, is actually from Southern Europe. So it occurs in oh, Turkey right. uh, and the Iberian Peninsula. And we actually, I was fortunate enough to, to have a couple of students who did some work and, and we went to the Iberian Peninsula and we sampled populations there. We didn't make it to Turkey, unfortunately, um, and, and looked at the levels of toxins in both the native and the introduced um, range of, of rhododendron. So for, we looked at Scotland and Ireland compared with, with, with Spain and Portugal um, and looked at the, 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 the sort of the concentration of the toxins. Um, in Turkey it's really interesting because the honeybees actually do make honey from rhododendron nectar and so you get this so-called toxic honey or mad honey. Um, and so you know we don't we don't know what's going on there. We don't know whether the, the, the honeybees are, are imbibing the, the, the nectar into the honey stomach and bring it back and regurgitating it before it has any adverse effects on them, or whether they have evolved, you know, there's a different subspecies of honeybee there, whether they have evolved um, to be able to cope with the toxins and, and detoxify them. We don't know. We, 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 that's, that's, um, the, the, the jury is still out on, on, on that. There's still so many questions around the rhododendron and, and toxins and its pollinators. Right, okay. Uh, Steve is asking, you mentioned European grants. Will these funds be affected since Brexit? Oh, that's another good question to which I don't have an answer. <laughs> All right, well, okay. <laughs> Hopefully not for our ongoing project, because actually the Poshby project is coordinated by um, by British partners, so, so we're hoping that, that there isn't I think there was some guarantee given um, by, by the, the, the British government for ongoing research grants. We don't know what's going to happen in, in the future. Hopefully here, here in, in, um, in Ireland, we, we should still be OK. Right. Well, I think that was certainly the fear with a lot of uh, scientists and, uh, in the UK is that they could be sort of uh, pushed out of these various projects, which unfortunately we would really would like them to stay to stay in with. Okay. Absolutely, well, and there's you know there's such there's such a good community of researchers in the UK. Uh, you know to lose them out of the, the European funding system and research uh, networks would just be such such a shame, such a loss. Right. Okay. Um, from Norman, it says, "How bad are neonicotinoid pesticides for bees now banned in the EU but allowed in the UK?" I think it's re re related to the. Um, an alliance for um, neonicotinoids to be used in the sugar beet crop in, in, in England at the present time. That's right, yeah, and, and I, the reason I'm smiling, Norman, is because um, I, I said at the beginning that I wouldn't talk about pesticides this evening. Um, uh, it's, it, so I suppose when we talk about neonics, um, they're, 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 they're obviously they're designed as, as um, to be toxic to insects, and so if they turn up in uh, in insect food or the insects are exposed to them in any way, then they're, they're, they're going to be toxic to them. Um, not always at a lethal level, but quite often at a, at a sublethal level. And, and really, there's still so much, so much we don't know, I suppose, of, of what we do know um, is that these different neonics, so there's different types of neonicotinoids, uh, the different um, classes of different compounds, have differential effects on different insect species at different concentrations. They cause lethal mortality, they cause sublethal, so behavioral effects um, that affect things like their foraging behavior, affect their learning and memory, affect their uh, reproductive output, 
Um, and, and we're only really just beginning to get a handle on all of those effects. I think one of, one of the, the, you know, so, the, so the, there are three of these neonics have been banned across Europe and there has been this rollback on that in, in, in sugar beet in the UK. One of the big problems with neonics is that they're, they're water soluble. Um, so they, they dissolve into the soil water and into the groundwater and into freshwater surrounding um, agricultural areas. Um, and they're very persistent, so they can they can hang around for a long time. But um, yeah, that 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 that's a whole other lecture. Mick is asking here, what type of hives for honeybees were used for the posh bee project? Oh gosh, Mick, I'm really sorry. I I don't know. Uh, is the it's my honest answer to that? Okay, we we'll move on. Um, sorry. Uh, is a fifty fifty mix of urban housing, uh, the flower gardens, and rough grazing uh, and varied boundaries a good mix for honeybees, i.e. the 50% grass is not single grass species. Um, yes. Uh, from John. yes. So, uh, so, so John, I think, it, I think what you're asking there is, is in terms of both the, the, the sort of the different types of habitat in the landscape and then also the composition of grass and the grassland. Uh, I, I think um, my, my, my feeling from, from the work that we've done and, and the studies from elsewhere is that diversity is, is always good. So diversity in terms of the landscape, so having different types of habitat in the landscape. So if you've got urban housing with flowery gardens and you've also got semi-natural remnants and you've got um, laneways and pastures, you know, having a mixture of all of those things brings diversity, brings lots of different resources for different insects. Um, and within a grass sward, um, if there's more than just grass, it can, it can, it can also be uh, more productive, it can be more tolerant to drought, um, it, it, you know, there, there can be lots of benefits with that as well. So, so I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of diversity in, in, in all cases. Okay, and Thomas is asking um, uh, what species of trees are most beneficial to honeybees? Oh, that's, no, that's a good question. Uh, Thomas, I, I don't know the answer to that actually, but I imagine that um, there's some good resources. John, you probably know the answer to that better than me. <laughs> some uh, well, good resources say, uh, on the, the beekeeping um, websites. Uh, uh, sycamore, um, um, sycamore horse chestnut, a uh, big one, the really big one is lime, lime trees. So, mm. uh, and certainly, of course, then you're getting into the, uh, say, apple blossoms, that type of tree. In fact, quite often, some apiaries would have an apple tree planted around it because we get a swarm for some, uh, some people believe is that uh, honeybees prefer apple trees to swarm into. Again, that's okay. an anecdotal, uh, I'm not putting any science behind that at all. That's a pure bit of, uh, beekeeping is full of anecdotes. Uh, <laughs> and I'll say that straight away. But, it, but I think the, the, um, um, the surprising thing actually, when, when uh, studies have looked at the use of tree pollen by bees, because, you know, I think as, 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 um, uh, ecologists, you terrestrial ecologists, we tend to look down at the ground, you know, plant ecologists, we look at what, what's growing under our feet and we don't look up at what's going on. Um, and um, a lot of pollination research has focused on the ground flora. Um, and there's been some recent studies from, from Central Europe that have looked at pollen loads of bees and found a high proportion of, of tree pollen and not just from, from the kind of trees that we'd expect, the, the, that it's also they're, they're collecting from, from the wind pollinated trees um, like oak and, and, and things like that. So, so I think there's a lot we don't know about how bees are using tree pollen. I think it's, it's an interesting area. Certainly, you know, the, the things, the, the woody plants that we see in our hedgerows across Ireland are really important in terms of providing resources like the hawthorn and, and, and the likes um, in, in, in hedgerows and, and things like that. So uh, what are your views on growing saffoin on your farm for a bee food and a hay crop? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it depends, I, I, gosh, it's years since I've, I've, I've worked in a field full, full of um, sanfoin. Um, it, it, it depends where, what time of year it flowers um, and what other resources are available. Um, because if you just focus on, on, on a single crop, then you, you, you get a short flowering period. I can't, I can't remember how long the flowering period would be for, for sanfoin. Um, but it, yeah, it, it also, it only provides, um, it provides resources, for, uh, food resources for bees. Um, other pollinating insects can't really access the flowers because they're those, those, those pea 
pea flowers that 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 need um, the, the particular shape and size and, and activity of a bee to to open. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say if, you, if you're growing it as bee food um, for, for for honeybees and, and bumblebees, they certainly they they love it. Right. Okay. I think someone's asked you here how they can get hold of some free wildflower seeds. <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. Crazy, but I would think, I think you'll have to look on the internet for that. <laughs> but there are certainly suppliers of wildflower seeds. Um, I think certainly there, there's one in Northern Ireland. I can't just exactly remember where. But I, but I think it's, 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 uh, uh, yes, it's in Downpatrick. Uh, but there is um, this idea, say, that there's the, the group in, in England called Grow Wild and that they produce various seed mixes for certain parts of the country. So they will have seed mixes for, for the south of England and then the Midlands and Scotland and indeed in Ireland. So it, I think you just need a good search on the internet for that. Okay. And, and, and of course, the best source of local seed is usually in the seed bank, in the soil below your feet. Yeah, very true. <laughs> you like. um, I have to say, I like to, I like to photograph, you say, at Trinity College, um, showing that wildfire meadow. Because uh, I have certainly noticed an awful lot of um, gardens around here in Northern Ireland where people have gone out and deliberately taken over a bit of lawn and made it into a wildflower meadow. And, and it can look really beautiful, you know, it can look, really yeah. I think that the problem though is, is uh, trying to maintain it, but... Uh, I yeah. think and it's, well, establishing it in the first place is quite difficult as well. We actually, in, in Trinity, uh, because it's such a, a, a highly used public space, we actually use wildflower turfs. So we had turfs made and they were laid rather than uh, sprinkling seed. Right, okay. There's a question here from Andrew. Um, is there a link between forest edge and hive nest sites for numbers or was this not counted? Um, between forest edge hive and hive nest, nest sites. sites. It depends on, on the species. So yeah, forest edges can be really useful for providing nest sites for, for a range of different species. Um, it's I, I, we we haven't quantified it in, in Ireland in any of our studies, um, but it's it's a good point. It, you know, we we edge, edges of forests are often good. You know, we often think oh they're good because that's where you get the the, the, the flora, the, the 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 flowering plants um, uh, on the forest forest edges. But yeah, I think that they are important for nest sites as well. But it's not something that we quantified. Right. Okay. Um, it said, could uh, uh, Sian examine, define the different levels of bee health in the Dublin uh, Connecting Nature product, or project, I should say? Uh, gosh, yes, different levels of bee health. We, it, yes, you can um, quantify bee health in, in, in lots of ways. And, and at the beginning of the Posh Bee Project, I, I remember, you know, all these eminent um, bee scientists from across Europe, and we, we literally spent an hour because we were writing a proposal on bee health, and we, we spent an hour talking about what do we mean by bee health? Do we mean the, 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 the individual bees? Do we mean their, their virus load, their parasite load? Do we mean the colony and how the colony survives? Do we mean the population? Do we mean the community? Um, so there's lots and lots of different ways that you can define bee health. And so in the Posh Bee Project, what we're trying to do is measure lots of different, uh, we call them endpoints, um, so lots of different uh, parameters um, of bee health, you know, from, from the colonies and the social bees um, to, to the behaviour, to the individual fitness um, in the solitary bees. Right, okay. Uh, the, the next one is really a statement really from James. He said, I plan to sow out 11 and a half acres in this, this summer in Safoin. And he said he currently has four acres uh, in pollen and nectar, wildflowers and sunflowers. So I would say really good on you, James. That's great. <laughs> Sounds great, James. Yeah. Uh, Declan is asking, uh, he was wondering about wasps and do they harm our bees or do we need them for uh, pollination? Oh, wasps. Wasps are, are fabulous creatures. Um, there's lots and lots of different species of wasps. So, you know, when we think about wasps, I think we, we, we're conditioned to think about the, the yellow jackets, the, the, the ones that buzz around your picnic in, in the summer, the social wasps, the vespula. Um, but there's lots and lots of species of wasps and lots of those species of wasps are actually predatory um, or parasitic. And so they're really important in the food chain um, as, as, as 
you know, for, for, for controlling populations of, of other organisms. And adult wasps do visit flowers and so can act as pollinators. Now, because wasps don't feed their larvae on pollen, but they feed them on protein. That's basically the difference between, between um, bees and wasps. You think of bees as, as having evolved from wasps. They're basically vegetarian wasps. And um, uh, because wasps aren't visiting flowers all the time to collect food for their offspring, then they don't visit as many flowers. They're not, you know, they're, they're not foraging as much. They're, they're not acting as, as um, they're, they're, they're often not as good as pollinators. But um, yeah, wasp, wasps do lots of incredible and amazing things. And I can't remember what the beginning of that question was. I, I got oh, right. <laughs> um, uh, Sorry. Let's see, where is it? I'm just trying to think of that. What is it? Oh, no, I was really just whether uh, wasps actually harm our bees or uh, or do they need them for, well, well, certainly they do harm bees. I mean, uh, I lost three hives in about two days with uh, with a plague of wasps. About a well, and also you, you get, um, you know, some of these parasitic wasps uh, will um, parasitize the the solitary bees as well. So, you know, if That's you've got right. to tell, quite often you, you, you'll be hatching out parasites uh, rather than... Call them uh, cuckoo bees, it's not right. Uh, um, yeah, well, they're actually they're bees, um, as yeah, opposed that's to right, the bees, that that's that's right. take over, yeah, take over the nest. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think we're going to just make this the last question. Um, uh, um, is from Andrew, and he says, "In recent times, have you detected an increase or a decrease in the population of pollinators?" Oh, that's another hard one. Um, populations are really hard to measure. Um, without a good baseline. So any, any study of biodiversity and, and biodiversity decline needs to know what was there before. And, and really we don't have population level data to be able to demonstrate decline. What we have is distribution data. So we know that um, some pollinator species that used to occur in some parts uh, of, of Ireland don't occur there anymore. So their ranges have shifted and, and usually contracted. And, and certainly for, for some of the rare species of bumblebee, we know that their range has contracted to the west of Ireland. Um, but in terms of population level decline, it's, it's really hard to demonstrate. And what we really need, um, and certainly, you know, to see whether actually our actions from, from the pollinator plan and, and other initiatives are successful, we need some, some systematic monitoring of um, where different species are and how relatively abundant they are. And that needs to occur over a long time because if you just take a single time point, insect populations can vary massive from, massively from year to year due to weather conditions, um, due to what happened the previous year, due to how many parasites there are around. Um, and so it's, it's really important to have a, a systematic and sustained monitoring in order to be able to, to answer that question pro properly. I think anecdotally, a lot of people would say, yes, that they're, they're still in decline. Lots of species are still um, declining in, in both range and abundance. Brilliant, right. Well, Jane, many, many thanks for that. It was a very, very yeah. interesting talk. Um, and, and I think uh, certainly when you get into landscapes and bees, we look at that and we, and we beekeepers are absolutely dependent on, on, on the landscape and how varied the, they should be. Um, I have to say, I think we've had a really uh, remarkable response this evening. I think it's, uh, I counted about the highest number joined about 270 people. And certainly a lot from Ireland. There are some from Scotland, from England uh, and Wales. So we're covering all the, uh, the, uh, the UK. And um, Albania. <laughs> and the farthest one uh, was from Albania. So it's brilliant. So, so um, thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, I hope certainly we'll be able to see you uh, soon at the Austin Beekeepers Conference. Okay, thank you. Thank very you much. for having me. Thanks very much. Yeah.